set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers. Fire and flame your ministers. You set the earth on its foundations so that it shall never be shaken. You cover it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly. The cedars of Lebanon that he planted in them, the birds build their nests. The stork has its home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, and the rocks are a refuge for the conies. You have made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness, and it is night, when all the animals of the forest come creeping out. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. People go out to their work and to their labor until the evening. How diverse is your work, O Lord, in wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, with living things, both great and small. There go the ships and the whale, you formed to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him for my joy is in the Lord. This is the word of God. So here we are. Uh, tomorrow is Tuesday. Wednesday is coming. And you just cannot wait to get back to that ordinary grind of life. And I hardly heard an amen of enthusiasm <laughs> as you thought of what it might be to get back to reality. And our theme tonight is face 
works. Not that faith works, because we've been looking at how faith works all this week. But faith at work, which is why the reading that we've just had, which we've seen and heard, is so relevant, because we've heard of a God who works. But the issue is, how are we, on a day-to-day -day basis, to make sense of where God fits in to the workplace? Now, I realize in a crowd like this, there are quite a few people who don't work. I mean, there's a lot of students for a start here, I can see. That's how to win friends and influence people. That's just revenge, because I'm currently paying for two of them. Not None of you two. Actually, I probably am as well, judging by what the the government would like to have from me. So I understand that there's, there's this skill students have to avoid real work for as long as possible till they're 35 or 40 or whatever. And, uh, and there's, there's this thing called a year out, which you need to have several of in order to, be a, to fulfill yourself. And then there are others who perceivably don't work because you've done your stuff and uh, you're looking back at the rest of us and you're a, a gran or a granddad or someone without kids but who's been an aunt or uncle and helping around. And I'd like to think that what we do here tonight is relevant to all of us, though I really want to concentrate on what it means on a day-to-day -day basis to work things out in the workplace. And you may say, well, why me? And this was, this was the struggle, really. When you've got a subject like work and you search the whole of the Spring Harvest team and you say, who could preach on this subject? And you realize that, uh, as far as you can tell, they live these, in these sort of quaint religious lives where they, they spend hours in prayer every day and uh, in, a, in a very different and foreign environment. My qualifications are, until 18 months, I was VAT registered. All right, so that sort of gives you a, a qualification from where I am. And I'll be telling you something about my history over the past six to nine months, which uh, is kind of relevant to where we are. Uh, but even working within a Christian environment, in a Christian business, you need to know that it's not so far removed from a real world. Uh, dealing with issues like uh, employment law and budgets. And things got so interesting recently, I decided I would do one of these management courses on how to manage difficult people. That's, uh, that's very nice. And in truth, do not imagine even the Christian organizations that are here, that somehow when people leave secular employment and are transferred into Christian employment, suddenly they become perfect. Issues I've had to deal with over the past months in my environment have included theft, uh, sexual impropriety or, or lack of wisdom, uh, incompetence, gossip, and so this lovely environment you imagine that sort of happens under a Christian heading is not necessarily true. The difference, I think, for those of us who have been paid to do God's work, as opposed to those who perceive themselves to be being paid not to do God's work, and that's not the way it is at all, is really the environment. The structures are very similar. And what I've discovered is that over the, the years that I've been involved with Christian work, which are, are many now, the number of people that I've interviewed who've wanted a job. And when I've asked the question, why, the answer has come time and time again very consistently. Because I can't understand where God fits in with what I'm doing from nine to five now. And I thought, if you're only working nine to five, I'd stay there, baby. That doesn't sound a bad deal. But that was the struggle. I cannot see, and I, I've lost count of the number of people who said it. I cannot see how God fits in to where I am on a normal working basis. I interviewed a number of potential salespeople to, to handle radio sales. And they came from a secular sales environment. Several of them said, I'd love to work somewhere where if I went out to sell, it didn't matter if I came back without making a sale. <laughs> Thank you, goodbye and good night. There's the imagination that the, the Christian environment is somehow frothy and cotton woolly and pray and all wonderful. 
And out there somehow, it's very difficult. And if only you could escape into it, into God's world, it would all make sense. What I want us to do for our time together is trying to explore some of that together. Where does God fit in? Do you go off to work whistling that happy tune from Walt Disney? I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. Is that... <laughs> And that's the problem for many of us. We can perceive no more than the, the drivenness of the bank account, the drivenness of the deficit mortgage, the drivenness of our wonderful students who'd like some money sent soon. We have a drivenness simply to say, how do we get the money in? And there are people who say, if, well, if only my job made a difference. And I can think of people I've met this week for whom this conversation is hardly worth having. Spoke just a few minutes ago to someone who spends her time caring and helping others to care for those who are HIV positive. And you kind of feel it doesn't matter how long the hours are or how secular the environment, and that isn't a particularly secular environment, but that would be all right. You can be a nurse or a teacher and it's all wonderfully fulfilling until you become a nurse or a teacher in the current environment and you wonder how really fulfilling it can be. But the thought of doing something worthwhile makes sense. But the thought of just sewing buttons on tunics or whatever, you know, a checkout girl, where can God be in all that? My wife Rosemary has struggled with some of that. And so I guess we both bring our own excursion because though my environment has always been since my early 20s, uh, an environment of Christian activity, I've, I've managed to maintain a relationship with my wife who lives in the very real world. She reminds me that very regularly. Uh, she was the one who would cause utter confusion by the, the people who would stop you on the street and ask you questionnaires. And she'd be asked, what's your occupation? And she'd say, a domestic engineer. <laughs> and the researcher would look worried and think she was a wonderful person. And Rosemary would tell you exactly what a domestic engineer was in the words of just one or two syllables. And she struggled because she wasn't a great career person, trained as an actress. I encouraged her to keep going at it, but she decided she wasn't ambitious enough. But there came a point when she reached, even as a mother of five children, with a commitment to motherhood, and she's a brilliant mother, that somehow, how many more bottoms did she have to wipe? And the struggle with that having any meaning or purpose was there. I remember someone I worked with in an advertising agency. He and I worked in opposite desks. We spent our time during the day making sure that advertisements appeared in newspapers or on television. You ran upstairs and downstairs, chasing things, doing this, doing that, knowing that if you got it wrong, the Daily Express would have a nice white half page in the middle saying reserved for and someone would have a very serious conversation with you the following day. I mean, the pressure to make sure that happened was enormous. And Martin came back the one day, the following day, and uh, I said, how was it? He said, oh, he said, you couldn't believe it. He said, I got home last night. He said, I got home. He said, he said and I had had a day. And when Martin said he had had a day, he had had a day. He said, I got home and my wife said, you do not know what kind of day I've had. She said, it has been terrible. He said, honey, what happened? She said, the rhubarb boiled over. <laughs> and that has never left me because though he, I think he was going to kill her and I'm not sure if he did. <laughs> but that spoke deeply to me. Because what is significant to us is our environment. And if the, if the whole life of that person revolved around the rhubarb boiling over, then you had to understand the world they lived in and the pressure they were under. So I want us to take an excursion for a few minutes and look at the world of work together. Why don't you just pause and pray with me and for me? Because we need to do some work together. And some of it is going to be work. So, Father, we pray in these few minutes we've got 
but you'll speak truth into our hearts and lives and minds so that we some see some things about work and significance for you we've never seen before. And we find ways to work it out in reality in the days ahead. Be a help by your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Where best can you start for a foundation than to understand that work was God's idea? Genesis 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Why? To work and take care of it. The basic foundation of everything we talk about over the next few minutes together is that God made man and put him in the garden to work. Work is not a punishment for sin. All right? Work was God's idea. He planned it and purposed it. When he made things and he put his sort of stamp of, of, of quality approval upon everything and said, good, 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 he didn't then say bad and label it work. God purposed that work was his plan for humankind. And though I use the word man there, you've only got to move on a couple of verses to see that God says, and I will make a helper, a co-worker, Eve, who will work with him. And the concept from the Bible of man being the, the hunter, provider, protector is not a biblical model for all time which is imposed upon us. It's simply the way the culture worked through the Old Testament. And it's very important for us to understand because the, the Old Testament describes something, it doesn't mean it's saying that that's the way it ought to be. Because something it happens in the culture of the Bible, it doesn't make it biblical. Important to understand that. There are different ways in which families work in different cultures. And if you were to believe that, for example, that the, that the, the patriarch father, uh, the head of the household, with the subservient wife running along several yards behind him, because that appears to be the model of the Old Testament. If that's the one you want to grasp because it's described in the Bible, then you need at least to take on the whole dowry system as well. I have four sons, and I quite find that appealing. <laughs> so I'm preaching against myself here. It's important to understand that cultural model, models described in the Bible do not become biblical edicts which we are expected to follow. And that's why I'm intrigued at the way we still have these insidious role models about what men and women are supposed to do in society. It came home to me not that long ago, preaching in what was then my church, uh, I wanted to illustrate sin. And I remembered the hoover and the light in front. And I just casually said of a, of a morning when I get up before to go to, I go to work, I always just run the hoover over the main living room. And, and I was aware of this snigger. You spared it to me this evening, but it was there. And what I was aware of was, was either the disbelief that a man could possibly soil his hands on a hoover or that I could do it. I was insulted with the second concept much more than I was the first. But the, the easy role model and stereotype we take in, you know, the new man has arrived, and my sadness is for many women who are now in the workplace, is that you are still left with most of the chores, if not all the chores as before, uh, but you're sharing in the work of the family. So women equally face the significance of the issues we're talking about. We were created to work. Some of it is paid employment. Some of it is unpaid employment. I struggled with that. I struggled with it for a long while. It seemed to me as a young radical, I can almost remember what it was like. The concept of gardening seemed to me the most unspiritual waste of time you could ever have. I thought the most useful thing you could do was to allow the weeds grow so that you could use it as a, a visual aid to the people next door to tell them the damage that the fall created. That seemed to be a, a, good, a good way to deal with these things. My wife has constantly undermined that principle for a long while. I walk through our garden for which she is the prime architect and feel grateful and guilty at the same time. I'm very good at pruning and burning. I usually prune and burn the wrong things, but I'm very good <laughs> at pruning and burning. But here was I stuck with this whole struggle that, that I, was, I was committed to God. 
I wanted to see the world change. Let's use our time for something worthwhile, like, like changing relationships and building the kingdom and doing evangelism and sharing Christ. And you can't, you can't spend your time messing around with gardens. Then I started to read the Bible, and I went down at the beginning and got very messed up because there it said that God's plan was that Adam would be a gardener. And I had to come to terms with the fact that there was more to life than the perceived spiritual agenda that I'd got. That God's prime plan was not Adam would be a worshipper, though he worshipped, but Adam would be a worker and that he would work. Of course, that's where we get into trouble, isn't it? Because we so easily make a nice, tidy divide between the spiritual and the secular. It's fine to be praying, but not quite so good to be pruning. I'm biased on that. I would rather pray than prune. But in terms of God's economy, there is the, the spiritual stuff and the non-spiritual stuff. When in fact the Bible does not make that division in any way whatsoever. Working, whether it's nine to five, seven days a week, whatever it might be, toiling and spinning, car mechanicking, whatever it might be, is as much a spiritual activity as doing church stuff. It has to be, because the reason God created Adam was to work in the garden. How can you not be doing something spiritual if you are fulfilling God's purpose for your life? And as you get up on Wednesday morning or whatever, and wherever you might be going, we need to be reminding ourselves that what we are doing there is as spiritual as standing on the chairs here and whooping and hollering for Jesus. It's different stuff, but it's the same purpose because it's honoring and being obedient to God. And we need to get hold of that. We need to understand the danger of the secular divide. And not to work is a denial of God's creation. Of course, work is tough. Work is hard. Work would have been joyful and easy if it wasn't for the fall. Work isn't bad. The toil of work is bad because that's part of the punishment, part of the consequences of our fallenness for God. That's why you don't always feel great when you get up on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or whatever. But the truth is that as we go and do it, however tough it might be, however much the toil might be, however much there might be adverse circumstances working against us to make it difficult, gardening would have been very much easier before the fall. I'd have had a lot less pruning and burning to do, but it would have been easier. And that's true in the environment of the normal workplace. It's tougher because of the fall. People would have been so much easier for personnel managers to deal with or human resource departments to deal with if it wasn't for the fall. Relationships between working people would be so much easier if it wasn't for the fall. Time planning and people keeping their promises would be so much easier if it wasn't for the fall. The fall makes it tougher, but it doesn't make it any less a spiritual activity that we need to be committed to and be involved with. And let me add this, that not to work is a denial of God's creation. Not to work is a denial of God's creation. Let me stress this in three ways. One, there are those whose abilities do not suit the convenient workplace. There are some whose abilities do not suit the convenient workplace. I'm talking about friends who, uh, who have a, a hearing difficulty, who are, who are wheelchair users, who, or who are unable to see. They are people who are marginalized in the workplace. And everything we do as an employer or as a society or as a community or as a church to make it more likely that they can find a place in the workplace is not simply doing a piece of social work. 
It's helping them to fulfill what God created them to do, and that is to work. The second thing is that, uh, that's relevant is the whole tragedy of unemployment. As Christians, we need to stand firmly against the economic manipulation of unemployment. Those people who decide the best way to manage inflation is to keep as many people unemployed as possible so that there are, the jobs in the workplace mean that people won't ask for rises in case they're made unemployment. As a clear Christian principle that Everyone should have the opportunity and right to work because that's why God created them and called them. We should be standing against unjust economic environments like that. Because, thank you. And the pain is that will cost us something. The people that talk about the feel-good factor need to know that it does not feel good to be unemployed. And anything we can do to stand there to give people dignity and purpose and companionship and self-worth is important. But we need to understand that those who are not able to work lose more than dignity, purpose, companionship and self-worth. They also lose their prime role in society so far as God is concerned. So we need to work at that. And the third area which is a complete denial of all that God has created is the idle rich. There are the enforced idleness of the unemployed and the kind of showing off idleness of the idle rich. And that is equally a denial of the way God has made us. And so people who strut around with inherited wealth and, and walk the beaches of the world, it may sound wonderful, but however wonderful it is, they will never be a picture of what God created them to be. It's hard to imagine. It's tragic to me that whatever your view of the lottery might be, the great tragedy about it all is that people imagine that, uh, you know, those who say it won't change me, I'll go to work anyway, whatever that means, is a more biblical response to the lottery than anything I've heard. Because the thought that the great goal is to have something which will equip them with so much money they no longer need to be the kind of people that God has created them to be is a tragi tragedy. So the idle rich and the unemployed and those who are disadvantaged in the workplace are all issues that we need to deal with. For a few minutes I'd like to look at a character in the Bible who would help us to root what it is to have faith in the workplace. Because the problem with the word faith is it's abstract, you can't draw it. It's the kind of word, as I said earlier at one of the seminars I was at, it's the kind of word that you, you don't want if you're playing Pictionary, this game where you have to draw pictures and people guess the words, you know. If you're playing that game, you pray that you'll get a word like tree or house, you know. And when I draw trees and houses, they always look the same, so it's rather difficult. And you always get a word like hope, you know, you say, Lord, you've let me down again, how can you do that to me? And the faith's like that. It's very hard to illustrate what faith means unless you see it in a relationship to a person. That's why the story that Lowell told last night about Kennedy and himself is so relevant, because it helps us to see how trusting God works out. And I looked and thought and prayed and considered who is it out of all the Bible characters would be helpful for us to see so far as someone who was not a priest, wasn't a king, but was a, a worker. Uh, my eyes uh, uh, landed on Joseph, uh, someone that my daughter, to my shame, said the other day, well, no, more than the other day, um, oh, he's in the Bible, we've been singing about him at school, I, I mean, he's, he's in the Bible, I think there was this concept, because if you sing about Joseph at school, it's a bit like, you know, Alice in Wonderland, you know, rather than realizing he was a real character, and I'm assuming for, for time that all of us, or most of us, know the story of Joseph. Sold into slavery by his brothers, faithful in the workplace in Egypt, sexually trapped and wrongly uh, condemned, spent time in prison, came from prison to the palace. I'd like to move us, if we can, through from the pit to Potiphar's house, to prison and to the palace. 
I think we may not get all the way. We'll see how we do. So let's go to Act 1, if we may. The water hole. Because that's where he was thrown. Although there was no water in it. There on a remote hillside, 11 brothers took their revenge on the young 17-year-old. They were jealous, and they threw him down the water hole, having first stripped off his very colorful outer garment. And he was going to be left to die, and then Judah, a really nice brother, said, he is our brother, so let's sell him instead. I thought that was fairly typical of some families that I know. And so for the price of a slave, Joseph was on the way to Egypt. The relevance to us who want to serve God, what I'm aware of is how many in normal working life today find themselves in circumstances which are completely outside of their control. They are no longer working or in at the place of their choice. They may not even be in work, or the kind of work they're doing is not the one they would like to do. And I leave you to identify where that is for you. Simply somewhere where you are not in control of your own destiny on a day-to-day -day basis. Call it trapped, call it enslaved, it might be at home, it might be at work, it might be through negative equity, it might be because you're a parent, it might be all kinds of things like that. And there was a time when things looked extraordinarily bright. Like Joseph, you had dreams, and you told others about your dreams. And now this, symbolically like Joseph, You've been thrown in a pit, sold into slavery, and you've been taken away from the special place you dreamed you would be. And the only way to make sense of that is to go 20 years on in Joseph's life. Because 20 years, almost, you find in Genesis 50 these words. As reunited with his brothers, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good in order to accomplish what is now being done. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good in order to accomplish what is being done now. The pain of the present in God's economy was going to bring fruit later. That's what Joseph said some 20 years after the event. What we don't learn from the scripture is what he said at the time. It may be nice that the Bible didn't record it. It may be that the, uh, the Bible assumes we will understand. The Bible doesn't say how Joseph felt. But I'd like to believe that the concept that he realized 20 years later was already built into the life of a 17-year-old young man who was going to be prepared to trust God because I think I see it in his character over the years that followed. And when we talk about faith at work, I believe a, a significant part of faith at work is that faith is claiming now the reality of something which has yet to work out. Faith is understanding the reality of that concept, that what is happening to us now will only possibly be explainable in terms of something that will happen in the future. That there will come a point when we will realize that the pain of this moment the hurt of this moment, the deep disappointment of this moment, the prisonership of this moment will only be explained in terms of what happens at some point in the future. Did God cause Joseph to be thrown down a pit and thrown into slavery? No. Did God allow it to happen? Yes. Did God cause your present situation? No. Does he allow it to happen? Yes. Why? to accomplish something that we know nothing about at the moment. And we are busy, and understandably so, as fallible human people, craving protection from the current, present pain that God is allowing. And we don't need to know what God has got in mind. 
as we cry why, we do not need to know what God is mind, what, what God has in mind. What we need to know is what God is like. We do not need to know what God has got in mind. We do need to know what God is like. And I believe that Joseph as a 17-year-old had some understanding of a faithful, loving God, a God of purpose and of providence. God intended it for good. And that is a fixed point that we need to steer our lives around. That is a fixed point that we need to steer our lives around. We need more and more, if we're going to understand how faith works, is to get something that we, we, we consider that is true and we steer by. Let me give you an illustration. About two weeks before Rosemary and I came to Spring Harvest, we went to a funeral of a little seven-year-old girl. The brightest, sweetest, bubbliest kid you could ever wish to meet. And we sat in a church. She was a daughter of a very, of very good friends of ours. The church was three to four hundred people in it. Uh, there was hardly a dry eye, particularly mine. And then the child's mother stood up. And she said with amazing courage and clarity, I am known to you all as being a very ordinary mother and woman. And I'm currently living through everyone's worst nightmare. But she said, because of what I know to be true about heaven, this is seeing our family through. And Rosemary, who was next to me, who was blubbering worse than I was, said, I could never do that. And the answer was, right now you couldn't, because you don't need the strength to do it right now. But there will be times when we need strength for those kinds of moments. Why do I give that illustration? Purely because here was faith in the unseen, Faith in what was known to be true as a fixed point, making a significant difference to the way people behave. And whatever situation you may be in where you feel trapped or disappointed or let down or bereaved or hurt, we need to understand that the truth that others may have meant it for bad but God meant it for good is one of those fixed landmarks with which we have to deal with. And if we're going to be people of faith in the workplace, we need to get hold of that and steer by it. We need that kind of fixed point. See, God's interest in us also needs a New Testament perspective. God's interest in us also needs a New Testament perspective because God's plan is also that he should make us like Jesus. Let me tell you, if I may, just touch on something personally for a moment. What I'm talking about here is not abstract. I want you to understand this. This is not abstract. Because for all the dreams that I had about being involved with Christian radio, this past November, in the midst of a financial crisis, the trustees asked me to leave. The parallels there in terms of the way I was dealt with and the way Joseph was dealt with seems to me to have very close parallels. And it's simply not appropriate to deal with details here. But I want you to know that I would not be able to make sense of my life, nor would Rosemary, if we didn't find ourselves saying as best we could in all the pain that we felt, that though we do not understand what is happening now, we do believe that God is a God of love and compassion and commitment, and one day it will make sense. And a number of people overwhelming number of people have said to me, God has something better for you. I want to tell you that the better he's got is that he will mold me to be like Jesus. That's the better. It's quite conceivable that I will never do anything as exciting or, or as significant or far-reaching again. Maybe I will in God's goodness. But the vindication of what happened to me does not depend on getting something brighter or better or gooder. The vindication of what happens to me is somehow that I will make sense of what God has done. Someone wrote to me and said, 
this must be a tremendous test of your faith. And I jerked back and I thought, you know, Lord, it isn't a test of my faith at all. In all the trauma that we've been through and all the shock that we've been through and all the dreams that have seemed to crumble, there's not been a sense that you've been distant from me, that I've lost you. I've lost faith in people. I've been disappointed in people. But there's no sense that I've lost my faith in you. This is not a test of my faith. It's a test of my character. I'm so thrilled for what Lowell and Candy are seeing as a vision and seeing them to work out. There's no sense of hurt and pain here that they've somehow got some brightness going. And we are going back from spring harvest with really no idea what our future might hold other than the need to be faithful. I speak eloquently about what it means to be unemployed because I know what it is to sign on. I know what it is to sit in the barber's chair. That's a shock for you. And have the barber say to me, and what do you do for a living? And to lie. It was only a half lie, but I would have probably fully lied if I'd have had to. Because the sense of worth had gone. And gradually we come to terms with it. So we have to deal with those things in reality. I'm not talking to you in an abstract sort of preachers, this is what the Bible says and you must do. Folks, faith is a journey we're making together. Let me touch two brief things before I close. The next picture we get is of, uh, is of Joseph. He's moved on. He's got a job. He's working. He's, he's in a good place. He's, in, he's with, with uh, one of Pharaoh's chief people. And he is being sexually chased. He's in a situation where he has difficulty maintaining his integrity. What is God looking for us in the workplace? He's looking for moral uprightness. He's looking for moral uprightness. As we work out our working life, God is looking for moral uprightness. Not just on the sexual agenda. He's looking for us to be people who are concerned that justice will be done in our workplace. That we're concerned about issues such as gossip and backbiting and justice and favoritism and prejudice and exploitation. That we'll be the, the people who will be prepared to stand up for what's wrong. And we will do it in the way that Joseph did. Joseph didn't just excuse himself, you know, find something else to do. He said in... Uh, uh, in verse 9 of whatever chapter it is, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? We need people in the workplace of faith who are prepared to name those things that break God's commandments of how people should work, those things that treat people as less than human beings, and to name them as being wicked because they are, rather than changing the subject, and talk about them being a sin against God, which they are, rather than trying to do some nego negotiations in somewhere else. And you say people would think you are a nut. Well, I think it depends on the moral fabric of your life. I think if we are expressing the character of Jesus by caring for people in a positive way in the workplace, we would be surprised how much people would welcome us making a difference. A friend of mine, when he was a managing director of a radio station, was asked to carry advertising for Sunday Sport. You've never heard of that newspaper, but it's salacious. He took the issue to the board. They said, Peter, we're really glad, glad you raised this issue. We're going to back you, and we're not going to run that advertising. That man is not what we would describe as a Christian. That's the challenge. But his moral integrity said, I'm going to hold something up. What a challenge to us who let things pass us by regularly in the workplace rather than standing firm. Act 3 puts us in the prison. Because of standing up against sin, he is wrongly condemned, and Joseph is in the prison. Imagine the confusion. You almost hear the conversation. Dear God, you, I've left my family. 
you've thrown me in the pit, you've sold me off, and I was in this great job. Finally, I'd made it. Why am I in the prison again? And there's two things here that we just need to grasp. Instead of sulking in misery, Joseph did what he could with what he had. He used his spiritual gifts and he waited his time. He interpreted dreams. He was still active for God, however bad it might be. And when he was forgotten and abandoned by people who promised they'd looked after him, he waited two years in God's time. And finally, we find him in the palace, remembered by a servant. And there he is in the land of the riches. And here, I think, is the biggest challenge of all. Because here we have someone faced with sudden riches and honor and power and prestige who maintained a consistent walk with God. And I believe those of you who are poor and struggling, unemployed, on the breadline, wondering how you're going to make it, are much closer to the kingdom of God than those people who find themselves with power and prestige and riches in their hands. Because even among Christians, I've noticed how swiftly power and authority and money corrupts. We need the vulnerability. And there's an amazing testimony, an amazing testimony about Joseph in chapter 41, 37 and 38. In the Living Bible, it says this, who could do it better than Joseph? For he is a man who is obviously filled with the Holy Spirit. Why was he a success in Egypt? Because the, the secular work people said he is so obviously full of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I can't remember the last time I ever heard someone say, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to fill God's calling on a day-to-day -day basis where he sent me. Adam clearly put to work in the, in the garden would have been full of the Holy Spirit. We spend our time seeking, and rightly so, all that God can give us to do church things, to do evangelism, to build the kingdom. The great call we've got is unless the people of God can be the people of God on those times when they do not meet together, when they're doing those things that God has called them to be, we will never make it. We have to find ways that those of us who are in the workplace know what it is to be so filled with the Spirit of God that we make a difference. And it's noticeable the reasons why Joseph was marked out as being full with the Spirit of God was because he was faithful, discerning, and wise. So that's our challenge this evening as we face the future and as you go back. And I believe it's a challenge of great hope because God can be everything to us that he was to that young 17-year-old taken out into slavery. What God looks is for those who are prepared to give him their day-to-day -day work in honor of what he's called us to do, to make a difference there and to be full of his spirit so people can see the difference as we make the work for justice happen. Faith works, put it to work day by day. Sorry, man.